Hello everyone and um, we're very pleased to welcome you all to Danos Group's first diversity and inclusion webinar. Thank you all very much for being part of it, particularly our three speakers. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Grant Potter. I'm a partner of the firm and lead our North America operation in New York City. My co-host Pete, you can probably see, Peter Yamezi is an associate partner in the firm and he heads up our European and North America practice. Um, we both sit on and are founding members of the Danos Group Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Danos Group is a global recruitment company that specializes in three main verticals, legal risk and compliance, all within financial services. We operate globally. We have offices in New York, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, doing more recruitment outside of the cities just mentioned than ever before these days. In the US, for example, over 70% of our roles that we work on are outside of New York. So in Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Houston, et cetera, as well as all of the US nearshoring hubs which I suppose in itself is sort of a diversification really. Then in Europe post-Brexit, we need the need for our services outside of London, across Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Dublin, Madrid, Luxembourg, the Nordics, to name but a few, has been surging for at least a couple of years. The same applies to APAC, where not, we not only cover Hong Kong and Singapore, but also Australia and various other hubs across the region. Um, the last and very important thing to mention about Danos is that we have three distinct offerings in terms of recruitment solutions. So retain search, um, contingency recruitment and uh, interim, so Danos Consulting, um, and across uh, and all three of those businesses span all three of our compliance, our uh, practice areas of compliance, risk, and legal. So, anyway, that's all enough about us. Um, importantly, why are we all here today? The short answer is this: to discuss ways to promote diversity and inclusion within the financial services industry, and how to hire the best diverse talent. As a staffing firm, we see it as our responsibility not only to promote d &I internally within our, within our own company, which we've actually done really well for a number of years, but also to help our clients meet their own d &I recruitment goals. So we feel that as recruiters, we can actually play a major part in promoting d &I and helping the industry as a whole become more diverse, simply by helping to recruit diverse talent. We've uh, various strategies to help our clients achieve that, but I'll, I'll come on to that later. At this point, I will hand over to Peter, who will introduce our speakers. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Welcome, everyone. Um, our first speaker this evening is Group COO and General Counsel of Man Group, and is also a member of the Senior Executive Committee. She chairs Man Group's Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee and is the senior sponsor of the LGBTQ Plus Network. She's been a key driver behind Man Group's Paving the Way campaign, which creates a pathway for diverse candidates to enter and succeed within the financial services industry and leads various industry initiatives, including the Speakers for School program. Please join me in welcoming Robin Grew. Over to you, Robin. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I, I think I was asked um, to... Um, effectively talk to you first about the challenges of attracting diverse talent pools, I think, in financial services. And I, I think it, it is no mean feat for us to effectively get to a point where we are credible anymore, where it is no longer optional. It's no longer, we're no longer necessarily the first choice for the brightest and the best. Uh, we no longer can get by with generic statements. Um, and it's no longer just an issue for you as a firm because our clients and our allocators care about this and they care about it quite a lot, not least of which because it, of course, is a good thing. They care about it because of this other focus uh, lens which they're looking through, which is ESG. So, so when I think about it and I think about what we are trying to do as financial services firms, I think we have to be authentic in our response to this issue. We have to show we mean it. We have to genuinely embrace diversity and inclusion and difference. And we have to make this such that it is part of the DNA of our organization. We have to test ourselves to make sure it's real. And by the way, we have to be uncomfortable sometimes with the output of it because truly difference is about not necessarily agreeing with each other all the time. In fact, having a little bit more challenge in the room, uh, my view. So, when I think about it, when I was asked, well, what do you actually do about it? I thought about um, when we think about candidate experience and we think about our employee experience, do we demonstrate 
externally that we care about this stuff enough. Um, and, and we can do different things on our internet sites and our information initiatives, which I think are actually very, very important. I think we can ensure that we have CSR reports and DNI reports which are available. I think that's important. But you also have to actually find ways of navigating and training your hiring managers and the people who are facing out of the firm on how to go out and speak about diversity and inclusion and how to go out and speak to candidates and think about the issues that they are facing when they're coming back into our organizations. You know, it, it was, um, I, I talk about a, 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 an initiative that we ran at Man Group, which was one of the cheapest things that we've done. And a couple of you might've heard me say this before, but we found on um, that the invisibility for LGBTQ plus was a problem. It was a real challenge. If you walked onto our training floors or our portfolio management floors or even our back office floors, you didn't really know whether it was a friendly place or not. And a group, not uh, that, that I was sitting in, but I, I, it was certainly not my idea, came up with an idea that was, well, how about we have pride flags? And, and we literally went to Amazon and we bought little flags that were so high that you could sit on somebody's desk. And we ordered 30 of them. And the 30 of them disappeared in a matter of seconds. And then we had to order 30 more and then we had to order 30 more and then our US office wanted some and then Hong Kong wanted some and so on and so forth. What did it do? Well, for a start, it was, it was amazing the uptick from allies and people who identify in that community. But what it enabled us to do was you walk across a floor or you'd be on a WebEx or now you're only on a WebEx. Some people actually took them home, which probably need to think about, um, but took them home and there you have pride flags across the organization. And overnight, for a very small amount of money, we dispensed with the invisibility issue. And that meant that when we walked into our meeting rooms or when candidates came to speak to us, or when we were on conference calls with clients and allocators or whatever it may be, they're just visible. It's just literally visibly in your eye line. And that matters it matters that it's part and parcel of who you are as an organization. We've also looked at broadening our channels and access points. So we have thought about, and we have talent, which we are returning back into the industry. So we've looked at women returner programs. We have what we think of as a secret weapon. We actually think we have the entirety of our organization who should act as referrals and people who are marketing for Man Group about what a great place it is to work and how diverse and inclusive we are. And so the employees of our firm are charged with being our representatives here who are out there talking to their friends and their family to say, listen, this is a great place. Think about these different things that we've done. So the marketing internally, the authenticity piece is a tremendously powerful weapon in being able to talk to tons of people that you might not get to or actually be trying to focus on tomorrow for a specific role but just start building a story and a narrative about your organization make sure that you are broad by the way in in the way that you talk about things it isn't just about gender it isn't just about ethnicity it isn't just about neurodiversity it isn't just about disability about all of these things in fact, I think the, the piece of the puzzle that is most interesting is the debate about how, how we have to get comfortable talking about every underrepresented group. I think the other piece that was very, very important as a firm for us and was part of something we did internally, but I think was tremendously important as we described our response was uh, the events of last summer were tremendously powerful and terrible and horrific and uh, discombobulating and difficult. And the ability in an organization to try and manage and navigate those painful moments when Black Lives Matter came to, to the fore was a real test of the organization, it was a test of, of how truly we were willing to be uncomfortable and to, I suppose, share the grief of what we were trying to face and then to take specific actions and not to shy away from those debate points. That has been tremendously important for us. And I think things like COVID present us with different opportunities that we need to talk about in financial services. We have all been tremendously blessed and capable of pivoting into remote, remote working. 
which means we have access points to new areas of talent where, where previously we might not have been able to access talent pools that were different. We now have that because we have a year's worth of proof that we can actually do this without necessarily having to all live in London or New York or Hong Kong or so on and so forth. I think the point is also that we shouldn't be competing with one another. And this was my final point. This is about ensuring that we as, um, as colleagues across this industry make the world a better place. I don't want me, man just to be better at this. I want all of us to be better at this. If we're truly gonna change the world um, and we should have, no, we shouldn't set our limits at our real estate footprint. Let's change the world. We can do it together. We are better if we do it together. We are better if we make financial services a place where people want to land. And so anything that I can do and anything that man can do to make this better for actually every single firm on this call, I'd be happy to do it. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Right. So our next speaker this evening is a rising star in Accenture's financial services business. She built and now leads the firm's business restructuring unit in the UK and Ireland. Her work includes creating, creating innovative solutions for banks, for global banks, asset and wealth management firms, as well as leading multi-billion pound restructuring deals. In addition, she sponsors Accenture's African and Caribbean financial services community and mentors entrepreneurs. A very warm welcome to Olochi Ikechi. Over to you, Olochi. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be here today. Um, and Robin, um, I must say that those are really um, warm words and I really echo all of that. So thanks for uh, thanks for leading us off. I think I think starting off, I mean, I, I've been asked um, to talk about, I think, the core actions that firms should be taking um, in regards to diversity and inclusion. Um, and again, to Robin's point, th this topic, diversity and inclusion is very, very broad, right? I think it's gone beyond the narrative that we know of gender, which is fantastic, but there's still more work to do. And I find it remarkable that over the last 12 months or so, um, I have probably seen more, more invites um, to either attend events like this or speak at events like this than I have before, which is great on one hand, but on the other hand, it tells me that we have such imbalance still because rightly so, certain organizations are playing catch up, playing catch up to the fact that this is a really, really important topic that we need to get right for our employees and our colleagues. Um, but at the same time, are really trying to, to understand what this, what this actually means and how we can actually have a better organization um, by, by implementing certain actions. So I think the learning curve for certain individuals and organizations is still, is still a steep one so we do tend to have that imbalance where we have these events and maybe they're not always focused on um, action oriented, orientated things that you can go away and do, practical things that, that people can do on the back of these. Um, so I think part of part of why I'm here is to um, really sh hopefully um, shone a bit of a spotlight on on getting things done in, in this space. Um, and I have spoken to a number of organizations, um, a number of, of people, colleagues, um, friends, etc. Um, and I've, 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 we as well at Accenture, we've, we've boiled down um, probably four core areas of, of actions or of things that organizations tend to do in this space or should be doing. Um, so that's what I'm going to go through pretty quickly um, today. So the first area is education. So really getting, as Robin was saying, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, getting comfortable um, interacting with other people who have completely different lived experiences than you. Um, and the education piece is not always for um, the, the person within the underrepresented group to educate you, but it's, it's, both, it's both ways. It's for you to also take the accountability to, to get educated. And sometimes we, we are seeing firms um, implement training programs um, to, um, to actually just assist with things like whistleblowing, but also implement programs where you can have things like reverse mentoring. So you actually partner people up together um, and probably partnering people up together who are on an unlikely pairing, um, which, which always leads to interesting results. 
Um, um, and I, I mentioned the whistleblowing as well. The second topic, just conscious of time, is advocation. So being able to be an advocate for something um, and for this topic, but be a proud advocate. So, you know, get behind, get behind your colleagues, get behind um, your employees, your people on social media. If, if there's something to be recognised or to be appreciated, get behind it proudly. You know, don't just like, maybe forward it, maybe share it, maybe comment but actually be it be a proud and loud advocate um, and there's also this sense of sponsoring someone when they're not in the room so um, a lot of people within underrepresented groups sometimes organizations may think okay uh, I'm going to assign a buddy or a mentor that's great but actually sometimes what people need is real sponsorship so get behind people and actually sponsor them and actually be the person who advocates for them when they're not in the room so again partnering people up on on allyship programs for example is something that we've done at Accenture um, again, partnering people with with unlikely allies and actually getting people to sign up to be an ally where you would probably not think of that particular person as your first your first you know the first person that you think of when you think hey I want I want this person to be an ally on my diversity and inclusion program which covers as Robin was saying that the full spectrum of of diversity and inclusion. Um, the other thing, um, the third thing is, is investing. So invest in time and invest in money, right? Invest in, invest in both of those things wisely within your community, within, within the firm, but also outside in, in the broader community. And this could be um, investing in um, specific leadership programs. We hear a lot about trying to, um, you know, get to get, get organizations to get a bit more equilibrium at, at C-suite level. Um, at senior leadership levels and that means really taking people up through the firm as well as hiring in so really investing in your middle mid-level managers to actually get them through the, the organization and again partnering with 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 strong sponsors as I mentioned in the previous point so making sure that those people have strong sponsors but you've also invested in a a leadership program um, to actually develop that 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 particular group of people and again it's just about getting everyone to a level playing field um, there's also a lot of things that you can do to invest in your communities um, whether that is supporting local businesses one of the conversations that I've been having um, outside of Accenture is um, really thinking about how we can support more um, for example black owned businesses in the city of London so we know that organizations like all the people all, all of you on this call have probably got a lot you know you've probably got agendas um, already in place in your organizations small to medium enterprises and startups probably don't have the luxury of having all the capabilities and the tools that big organizations have so actually how can you give back to the community um, and another thing that I would like to say on community is schools and I probably should have mentioned it in the education piece because this stuff starts from early it starts when we're young so how can you encourage the teaching in your in your in your in your um your if you have children in your children's schools um because as we know this this stuff all starts from from young how how do we teach our kids to 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 ensure that they are actually being inclusive as well in the playground etc um, and then the last piece um, I want to mention is just around evaluation, um, constantly evaluating your agenda. One thing that I was talking to your, your diversity and inclusion agenda, and one thing I was talking to Peter about recently was the fact that we talk about diversity and inclusion a lot. Um, but there's also belonging. And for me, um, working backwards from belonging is, is actually more important because if I feel and if my teams feel like they belong for, for who they are, then they will feel included. And then we, we should naturally hit our diversity stats because by virtue we are include we're, we're making everyone feel like they belong and we're making everyone feel like they are included. Um, so really, you know, Get it, get in, um, get into a point where you can actually step back and look at your DNI agenda and say, what else are we actually missing? And this is something that we did at Accenture, and we've we've included a a belonging um, pillar 
that is it for the four pillars so to recap educate advocate invest and evaluate um and that that's that's yeah they, those are some of the key takeaways so hopefully you, you find some nuggets of practical things that you can actually do um on a day-to-day basis going forward thank you very insightful you're welcome excellent um Our final speaker this evening is a partner within the people consulting practice of PwC UK. She helps her clients to improve business performance with a particular focus on diversity, inclusive culture and purpose. She's a strong advocate for women's economic empowerment and has been recognized with several awards for her global campaigning for greater gender balance across organizations. She's also a global co-chair of the 30% Club which is a campaign group for business chairpersons and CEOs taking action to increase gender diversity on boards and senior management teams. Please join me in welcoming Brenda Trinaldon, CBE. Over to you, Brenda. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to focus, um, and, and you know, we've heard this a lot from, from Robin and, and from Alucci as well, Um, on the importance of inclusive culture. Um, But before I get into the detail, I think it's worth framing it in the context of the growing trend for businesses to be more purposeful, because I think it all ties together. And I think it's a really important thing as we look to attract talent and, and to think about how people look at us as organizations. So I think, first of all, probably everybody has noticed that over the last couple of years, there's been a real, there's been a seismic shift around the relationship between business and society. Um, You've probably noticed that there's increased expectation, even from yourselves as consumers, but also from investors, from employees, and even from regulators for businesses to demonstrate the value that they bring to society. So we're really seeing a shift from shareholder capitalism or shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism. And I think that that really plays out when we look at how we attract talent. And one of the things, you know, in, in the U.S. was when the Business Roundtable redefined the, pur- the purpose of a corporation. I think it was back in the summer of 2019, 181 CEOs committed to lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders. Now, what I will say is that in some cases, we're still seeing virtue signaling. You know, it doesn't actually all flow all the way through for all those companies signing up. Um, We have seen a number of businesses here in the UK, like RBS, NatWest, talk about being purpose-led. And for anyone that's spoken to Alison Rose, she actually really does mean it. And she looks at, you know, how that flows through the company and what it means, you know, from from actions day to day. Um, We've heard BlackRock talk about it. We've heard BP and many others. But what I've seen and, and how it's affected me personally is when purpose comes into how I behave on a day-to-day basis. So is it around how I take decisions on credit, on risk? Who do we do business with? You know, how does purpose flow down and into into how I do my work? And I have to say, I joined um, PwC about 18 months ago. I had a career of of almost 30 years in, in financial services. And I interviewed with a lot of professional services firms. But the purpose at PwC of building trust in society and solving important problems really resonated for me um, personally. And everyone says this is something, you know, for millennials. Well, clearly I'm not a millennial, but it, it still was, was really important. And in every conversation I had and coming in as a partner, it was a six month process. It came through. And, and also the fact that the organization was, was all about growth mindset. And so these types of things were were really important to me. And when I speak to the younger people in the firm and the average age in our firm is about 28, they do all talk about that purpose piece and it's it's really important. Um, And so now if if we move from that onto IND and and I should start by saying, I talk about inclusion and diversity instead of diversity and inclusion. Um, because I think we've spent far too much time just focusing on diversity and, you know, just thinking about, can we have enough, um, you know, people um, of color? Can we have enough LGBTQ plus people? Can we have enough people with a disability? Without thinking about what's, what's the underlying culture in the organization to allow all of these people 
not only to survive, but to thrive and, and to succeed. So I now talk about inclusion and, and diversity. Um, and I guess the other point I would say is, you know, diversity is, is a numbers game. You know, it's, it's a stat, it's an outcome. But inclusion is something that you have to work at. You have to actually cultivate it. And it's, it's hard. It takes time. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but it, it actually is, is about, and, and something that, that Aluchi mentioned, it's, it's creating that environment where everyone feels valued and able to contribute. So when we think about inclusion, we, we tend to say that it, it, it's a combination of a sense of belonging, a sense of fairness, and a sense of trust. And personally, I think that if you can, if you can create that and you can bring a personal sense of purpose for your employees, then you're 90 whatever percent of the way there in terms of really creating strong engagement and, and really unlocking that ability for people to, to absolutely perform at their best and, and, and really you know, look to, to exceed expectations at, at work. Um, and it's, it's worth the effort. Creating and cultivating that culture is really important. Um, you know, all the research out there shows that organizations that, that get it right, um, you know, not only retain and, and develop their talent, but they actually are typically more innovative, more creative, they make better decisions, you know, they're more profitable. Um, and there's been an awful lot of discussion around conduct and risk and, you know, avoiding groupthink, all of those good things. Um, but actually also companies that are inclusive have greater insights into their customers and their communities. And so it does really help them to be more competitive. And it, it can really save costs as well. Um, we had that experience at PwC a few years ago when we were looking at turnover rates of about 17%. And I think our engagement scores were about 66, not at all where we wanted them to be. And as a partnership, we're very bottom line focused. So we spent some time really trying to understand this and look at where was that turnover happening? You know, why were we losing people? We did focus groups, you know, we, we did interviews. We looked at all the data. We're always very data led, which I think is, is really important. And when we found out why, we had very focused, you know, in action plans. And within two years, we brought our engagement scores up to 77%. Our turnover was from 17 down to 12%. But really importantly, we reckon that that saved us 50 million pounds a year. Because if you look at, you know, on average, you think about a year's salary in terms of, of um, getting people up to productivity, onboarding costs, and all of those things. So getting that inclusion piece right and getting that retention you know, can actually result in, in massive cost saving um, as well. Um, I think if I look at, you know, what are we seeing from clients and what are we working um, on with our clients today? You know, I mentioned being data led. I think starting with the data and really understanding, you know, what, what is your diversity footprint? And, and that's not easy. It's, it's quite hard. And especially if you're a global organization, it's nuanced in every different country. There's laws around it, you've got data protection, but you need to know what your starting point is so that you can then set some targets. Then I think really diagnosing what are your inclusion challenges? You know, what are those inclusion moments that matter in your culture? Because once again, if you don't really understand the underlying causes for exclusion or, or lack of sense of belonging or why you've got those turnover problems or you're not attracting people, you can't address it. And so really spending time doing, doing that inclusion work. And I can see Peter's come off mute. He's gonna, <laughs> gonna warn me now of my, my one, one minute. One minute warning. <laughs> um, and, and so I think, you know, I would really emphasize spending that time to listen and learn and assess before diving into solution mode. And I think, you know, um, the points that, that, that have been made around, um, you know, leadership, and, and language and, you know, really looking at role modeling. You know, I love the, the example of, of the pride flags. I mean, it's so simple, but, but from taking the invisible to visible, those types of things, you know, really showing people as opposed to just talking, right? And, and it's got to start from the top. So if you don't have that tone from the top and leaders doing it authentically, it's never going to work. And I guess the final thing I'd, I'd say is 
really thinking about how do you build that empathy? How do you get people to start to have those uncomfortable conversations? We're starting to use virtual reality. And we've just launched recently a virtual reality ethnicity experience where we put our, our senior management through a day in the life of a black colleague. And you spend 20 minutes going through all those microaggressions that somebody experiences in the office. And I tell you, the, the impact it's had on everyone that's gone through it so far has been phenomenal. They've said, A, one of the, one of the senior leaders I spoke to today said, it made me angry that it was happening. But at the same time, he said, I worried, oh my gosh, have I inadvertently done some of these things and not realized about excluding people? So I think we all have to be creative as well about thinking about how do we keep having those uncomfortable conversations and, and keep up you know, that, that sense of, of wanting to understand other people's situations and, and create that inclusive culture for everyone. And I'll, I'll stop there because I could go on about this forever, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda. Um, we're going to take some questions now. Um, and I have, I think it's probably best to go in the um, in original order. So um, the first question is for you, Robin. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what have you found most difficult about sourcing the best diverse talent? Um, I guess this is, a, you know, this is a very, it, it does sound like a very straightforward question, but I think ultimately there are some, some very difficult challenges that, 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 that lie in between. So we're just keen to get, get a better understanding of this. <laughs> what, so, such a huge question, right? Um, what, what, is the, what, what is the problem with it? Why can't we just fix it? Um, I don't know. I think we're just all rubbish uh, or maybe not. I think the hardest thing is, 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 is to Brenda's point, you want to be able to, you know, find the silver bullet and it just doesn't exist and you actually it, it's the hardest thing is to keep going when it's really hard it's to keep having the same conversations over and again it's about the discipline of looking where you can for shortlists that have diversity and requiring it it's about recognizing that when you're training your interviewers or you challenge yourself on what it is if you are always rejecting clients, sorry, if you're always rejecting candidates that are different from you because it's awkward and it's hard and you can't bond over where you went to school or what sport you play or whatever the heck it is. And, and I think it's that, it's the ongoing resilience to keep on looking at different routes and holding, holding your organisation accountable. Look at your recruitment rates. Look at, your, look at the people who you're losing. Interview them. What is it they didn't like about your organization? What did they love? What did they hate? And they're not trying to be defensive about it. Actually, I know this is gonna be a big shock listening to people. It's a rotten thing to do, but it's really, really important that we do that. If you are engaging people in the organization who are part of your diversity and inclusion and belonging efforts, listen to them. Don't just go, yeah, that's a different thing. And now I'm going to recruit in exactly the same way that I've always done it. You're actually keeping on going. But I think we have to recognize, we have to be humble about the fact that in financial services, we're no longer this golden place for people to land. It's not, it's not very sexy anymore. There is this thing called FANG. There, is this, there are lots of places as we develop that are more interesting and they might even have skateboards and table tennis tables and all sorts of exciting other things. We've got to move with the times and we've got to be realistic and we've got to understand, we've got to connect why financial services actually matters to society. Back to Brenda's point and Alucci's point here that, that connecting what we do and speaking to value sets and then living those value sets and then translating those value sets into people's careers and impact in organizations and greater society. That's what we need to do. And we, we, we just can't stop. We just got to keep on going. Excellent, thank you very much, Robin. Very insightful. Our next question this evening has actually come through from, from um, one of the attendees and I'm going to, going to put this to Oluchi. The question is, how are you tracking, managing and reporting on the DEI work that you're currently doing at Accenture? 
Great. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think with, with difficulty uh, is the honest open answer. Um, I think there's there's lots of different um, there's lots of different elements to getting this right and, and to the points that were made earlier, um, this can't just be a data gathering exercise. Right. So it's easy, yes, to, to, to say, um, you know, well, in fact, it's actually not always easy even to understand where all the black people are okay, in the organization or where all the various underrepresented groups are in the organization, because you have to firstly opt in to give to give that data. Um, and even when you have that, that that only gives you a sense of diversity, but it doesn't actually tell you how successful you are on your on the the, the entire agenda. And I think one thing that um, that holds um, that holds very true to all of the the, 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 the kind of the talks that you've heard today from all three of us is this piece around inclusion and belonging that that is really where we have to be starting from and how do you measure inclusion and belonging and if I can just give an analogy because I think it, it kind of sums up what what we've been saying um, for me the diversity aspect is being invited to the dance inclusion is being asked to dance and belonging is being is being able to pick the, the song of your choice and for me I talk about how having that, that family feeling whereby if I really feel like I, I am truly included, I truly belong here, I feel like I can completely be myself. How do you measure that? that that's really hard to, to measure. But one of the things that we've tried to do is actually just have um, some, some kind of deep, deep, deep um, surveys with people. So instead of just sharing a link, um, we actually um, we, we actually do a one-on-one -on -one, um, detailed um, kind of conversation ultimately where, where we're really listening to people but we, we, we tell them that we're capturing some of that information. How can we um, measure um, correctly how people feel and I think as, as we've heard earlier it's really listening to people really trying to understand so that's one of the things that we, we've tried to do um, you know you can call it a survey but it, it's um, I think a bit more a bit more than a survey um, and for us for me that that is that's the true measure of our success as opposed to yes we have a number of stats out there that we've published in terms of trying to get to um, and again we, we have focused on gender and on ethnicity more so recently but trying to get to a level of equilibrium for those particular groups by 2025 for example okay yes we can tick a box but how, how do, do, do those people really feel like they're truly included so I think there's still a way to go to be honest to get to a point where we can do this effectively and Another thing that we've we've also looked at is ensuring, as I think was also said um, by Brenda and Robin, um, ensuring that this is top down, right? So ensuring that how we are incentivized um, as partners, as managing directors across the firm is, it, it, you know, we have to be incentivized accurately to have all of this stuff part of our natural DNA. And we can't just be ticking boxes, but, but ultimately, we have to be incentivized. That group of people have to be incentivized and it has to carry down through the rest of the organization. Um, so, so that's another thing that we are looking into in terms of how do we actually, you know, switch the switch the switch the the, the dial in, in just how certain people operate in terms of, okay, we we work on a project, we work on a program, we assess our quality for that particular client, but we assess it based on, you know, that maybe um, the quality um, that the client tells us that we've delivered or um, financials, do we assess it really based on how people feel? No, but should there be an element of that? Yes. So I think we are still working through how we will truly assess this, um, but there, those are some of, so, some of the ways we, um, we have, uh, we, 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 some of the things that we've tried to do. Fantastic, thank you very much, Oluchi. Our next question is for Brenda. Um, you mentioned virtual reality simulations, so that's attracted a lot of interest. Um, so are these virtual reality simulations offered through a vendor solution, or is this something PwC has built internally and might offer to clients in the future? So um, this one is something that, that we've built internally. Um, there are external um, VR solutions out there but what we've looked and we, we didn't find anything that actually you know met our needs and so 
it was a joint project between the consulting practice that I lead and our internal people. And we looked at what were the two things that we really wanted to run hard at. The first was ethnicity. And then the second one is going to be disabilities. And so we worked with our multicultural business network. Um, we worked with some of our our black partners and directors um, as well. And we worked with an external script writer and we, we had so many experiences. I mean, we could have had a, a two hour experience, but we had to boil it down to it's about 18 minutes. And so it, it, it does have a bit of a, a PWC feel, but actually we have started showing it to clients as well. And we are offering it as, as part of a broader solution with clients. And people have said, even in very different businesses, it really resonated. So, um, so it's it's one that that's our own creation, and I think the next one that we're going to do after this, as I say, is is an experience that you you go through, where um, where you experience what it's like to have a, a, a disability, and I, I think there's masses of opportunity in this. All the we have a, a VR team that's been doing a lot of research at looking at all kinds of soft skills training and things, and and all the research shows that by that immersive experience. It just has a lot more, it has longer term impact than learning just on a PC or reading on, and doing things um, in that way. But I would say it's, it's like unconscious bias training. You can't do it in isolation. You know, just by putting someone through that experience isn't going to eliminate their biases or, you know, isn't going to, isn't going to solve any of the problems. But as part of a broader program, it does really help with that. We call it unfreezing. And creating the emotional response that we all know that that you you need to start to make you want to change behavior, um, and and we add to it. I mean, we 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 have um, reading groups, and we have people read much more broadly. So book lists of of authors that are very different to you and experiences and things. Um, we suggest people like Netflix watching of things that will give people a different experience as well. We have groups called Color Brave, where people come and have those uncomfortable discussions and you know the elephant in the room kind of things and, and, and continually get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, so lots and lots of other things as well as commitments. And, and then it, it, it all comes back to you know, looking at those challenges. And, and you know, as Aluchi was mentioning, you know, really thinking about, I mean, we look at proportional promotions and things. So looking at a population and saying, if, if promotions aren't you know, proportionate to the population underneath, starting to challenge and in moderation discussions, you know, challenging. So it's all part of a broader program. I wouldn't wanna say VR in itself is, is the answer, but I think it's a really interesting way to, to create that, that empathy and understanding. And it's, it comes back to, you know, what most people, you know, learn when you're small, when your parents say to you, put yourself in the shoes of someone else, you know, always think about if you can put yourself in the shoes of the other person, you can create a much better relationship and understanding. And so we, we call this experience in my shoes. And I hope we can do lot, lots more. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brenda. Hey, I'm just going to jump in with one final question, actually, if you don't mind. Um, and that's actually, I think maybe that maybe it's kind of directed to Robin. It's a question I picked up from Satnam um, that he sent out, which is all talking about kind of punishing, um, punishing is obviously not a particularly positive word, but punishing failures in relation to cultural change in this space. One of the things I've seen uh, and seen discussed, and it's very kind of, um, current is at board level people are talking about uh, total compensation and total compensation being linked to managers and it's obviously got to start from the top down um their total is going to link to hitting metrics in relation to, to dni and i'm just keen to see from your perspective whether that's something that you agree with and think could be put into place because obviously it's a way of it's one way of, of dealing with it well, I think that let me build off some of the work that Brenda's done as well, because um, yeah, this is the 30% club. This is where it starts in, in gender. You're starting to see the UK race charter trying to look for and trying to, to work out what whether targets or we should be looking at trying to put targets in place for race and ethnicity. Um, and I think there is something, punishing is such a strange word. I, I, I think what we should be doing is rewarding and encouraging. I think, though, on the back of that, 
to be clear about what success looks like and whether you've achieved it or not. And to some extent, I think this is a Lucci's point, recognizing that compensation um, is part and parcel of that. But let's also be clear, there isn't an easy solution here. It isn't that if you have run a quant, part of our firm is quant, as you all know, it's really, really hard to get you know, to, to suddenly fix the problem that is coming through our schools and our universities in countries all over the world. So, so there's something about recognizing that your commitment is, is broader than a you know, it is broader than one dimension. It's broader than women, it's broader than black, it's broader than Indian, it's broader than disability, it's broader than neurodiverse, it's broader than social mobility. It's all of those things. So when we say what is diversity and how do you reflect it? The problem I have with some of the stuff that's coming across corporate boards at the moment is it's almost like if you don't have one of the above, check every single category, somehow you're failing. Not true, can't be right, because all of a sudden you're, you're creating something that is, is, is not authentic and actually, I think, create something that is worse. I think it starts to create the narrative that is, oh, well, she only got the job because, he only got the job because. That isn't the narrative we want. What we want is the narrative that says, we need to work harder to find diverse candidates. I'll give you a quick story. I'll try and keep this short, Dominic. But we had an event and I, I, I'll share people's blushes, but we had an event and it um, involved some of our women non-executive directors. And they eventually, these are the two or three people who have been um, around for a long time. Uh, one of them is a dame of the realm and all the rest of it. And eventually somebody at the end of this conversation and panel said, so do you believe in targets? Always a great question, I think, to set everybody nervous in a, in a group of the executive. And um, effectively, both of the, the, the non exec said, you know, I didn't used to, hated it, hated the idea of it, didn't want it, but actually, I think there's something to this. I think there's something to merit this. Conversation ends. We go and have some drinks afterwards in the days when we're allowed out and we're allowed to talk to one another in person. And one of my managers, managers, so somebody who's an indirect of mine, came up to me and said, who has five male directs and he is a man, and said to me, but Robin, are you telling me that I need to go and fire somebody and then hire a woman, a black person, somebody with a disability, so, so on and so forth. And I said, I'm not saying that to you, but what I'm saying is the next vacancy you have, you should try harder. He said, well, what if I can't find somebody? And I said, then you haven't tried hard. And he said, okay, so what if I go and hire somebody and I just put them into the job and then they're rubbish. And then I said, then I fire you for being a bad manager. And that is part and parcel of sort of the conversations we need to start to have about accountability for trying harder, for going further, for doing more and for not giving up in financial services. If we gave up, we'd none of us be here. We are a group of innovators. We are a group of people who can find solutions. That is what our companies do. That is what we hire. So the fact that we are giving up too easily on this is not OK. And so to the extent that that is reflected in your comp and reflected in your success and reflected in your authenticity to deliver the culture where difference thrives, that's where the rubber should hit the road. So maybe a, a too long an answer, but I'm hoping that gets you to the right place. <laughs> Thank you very much to all three speakers um, and over to you Grant. So as we bring the session to a close I'd like to obviously thank the speakers very much that was that was really excellent um, some really sort of incredible talking points there for us all to take away from today um, hopefully this has been an insightful session for everyone who attended. Um, so just wrapping things up just a couple of points to mention at the end here um, first of all uh, the first one is the Danos Group DNI report um, this is something that we produce. It's a living DNI report document, um, which we can share with anyone if they'd like to. Um, it covers our internal DNI ethos and how we promote it within the company, um, plus the various recruiting solutions and activities and so on that we offer to clients um, to help them bol bolster their own DNI agenda through recruiting and retaining the best diverse talent, which is obviously what we've just been talking about a lot. 
Um, for example, just a couple of things that we do. Um, when we put together short lists for searches that we're working on, we now make sure that at least 75% of the candidates are diverse. Um, it's been hugely popular, obviously, because it gives the clients access to the best diverse talent. Um, other things to do with unconscious bias, for example, I mean, I could go on and on, but we can do things like blind recruiting, um, where certain details are removed from CVs if clients want us to do that. Um, removing nationality from CVs obviously helps with mitigating unconscious bias. These are just examples. Um, there are many solutions, but we're open, we're always very open to discussion about incorporating other ideas to help promote the, our own client, our clients' own DNI um, recruiting agendas. So anyway, the, the, the bottom line is, I guess, from our perspective and hopefully from everyone else's, that a, a more diverse uh, workforce is, is proven to be more productive and more profitable as well as being an ethical ideal. So it's kind of the perfect combination, really. Um, we see it as our job as recruiters, specialist recruiters, um, to help our clients to hire the best caliber of diverse talent right now in their existing markets, but also to help them monitor the rising stars as they appear and then rise through the ranks. Thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate the audience and of course the speakers. Um, if there's anything that anyone would like to discuss, feel free to reach out. Thank you all so much.